everybody. Welcome to the Food Standards Agency September board meeting. We're meeting remotely and for the purposes of the record, this meeting is taking place in Cambridge. Um, we have no apologies for absence and we have the pleasure of welcoming Peter Price as our new board member and appointee for Wales and chairing our Welsh Food Advisory Committee. So Peter, welcome on board. Peter was appointed from the 1st of September. He's had a rather intensive couple of days of induction and now thrown straight into a board meeting. So I hope, I hope it makes sense. Um, and I'm sure everybody will be very uh, happy to help out with any queries or questions as they arise, Peter. So thank you very much for agreeing to join us. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Good. Could I ask board members if there are any conflicts of interest that they wish to raise about any of the items on the agenda? And also if anybody has any other business that they wish to raise. Super. We'll now turn to public questions that have been received in advance of the meeting. Um, as our audience, regular audience might know, we are meeting more frequently, but for shorter periods of time because of the challenges of operating effectively for a long time on Zoom. Uh, so uh, we, we have fewer questions than, than we might have in a full board meeting in the normal rhythm of things. Uh, Stephen Pollock, our Director of Communications, will share the questions that we've had. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, yes, there are two questions from members of the public for the board today. The first question is from Katie Doherty, who is the Chief Executive of the International Meat Trade Association. And Katie asks, the industry is really struggling with the lack of clear guidance with regard to the health and ID mark from 1st of January 2021. We understand that the FSA is working to get that clarity, but this is absolutely urgent and companies need to know what the situation is for the UK market, the EU market and for non-EU markets. We have less than three and a half months till the end of the year and if companies need to approach their packaging providers to change their packaging, then there really is not much time. When can the FSA give the industry the clarity it requires? The second question is from Hayley Atkin who is a policy officer at the British Veterinary Association. And Haley asks, we would be grateful if the FSA board could provide an update on the uptake of the voluntary funding scheme to install CCTV in slaughterhouses in Wales and comment on next steps. And that concludes the questions to the board for this month. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Katie, your point about the high, uh, health identity marks is very well made. We are very seized of it. And I think we'll have an update from the chief executive in her report. Um, and I think the point about the uh, CCTV is not our regular board agenda on animal welfare at this meeting. That will be coming up at the business committee meeting uh, next week, I think. And so perhaps we might revert to that then. But you will get an answer on that question in any case. Um, if I turn now to the uh, minutes of our meeting on the 26th of August, first of all, congratulations to our secretariat on turning that, them around so quickly. We have all seen them in draft and had a chance to comment. Are we happy that they're an accurate record of our meeting? We are. And the note on the actions arising and our progress on those, did board members wish to raise any comments on any outstanding actions? No, thank you very much. Uh, Chair's report to the board is very brief because I've only had one event since we last met, um, which was uh, the Chief Exec and I had a catch-up meeting with Henry Dimbleby about uh, his progress and next steps and thinking on the national food strategy. Uh, so that was a, just a regular touch-in with him. Unless board members have any questions for me, the only other thing I was going to confirm was that there's still uh, not been any progress as that I'm aware of in advertising the role of chair of the FSA, uh, but I hope that we will see that go out to advertisement very soon. That rests with ministerial departments, it's not in our hands. And I will now turn to Emily, our Chief Executive, Emily Mars for her report. Thank you, Heather, and good morning, everybody. Um, so my report covers our current priorities of our COVID-19 response, um, EU exit, and, and it also touches on Kampala back to testing 
cannabidiol sem seminar that we held recently and discussions with the Home Office uh, on the lethal su substance of DMP. I don't want to give much detail on anything that's written down. I just want to update you on a couple of things uh, that have um, developed since uh, the report was published on Friday. Um, so first of all, on COVID-19, obviously the, in the last few days, we're seeing uh, an uptick in the number of cases around the country. And this is uh, reminding us that we need to be as ready as possible for the, po uh, for the prospect of increased staff absence again, and the prospect of needing um, flexibilities with the food industry to ensure food supply. Um, we have been planning over the next couple of months to do some detailed contingency planning uh, with the expectation we would need to stand up again our emergency response in December, um, particularly with an eye to the end of the transition period, because obviously EU exit and COVID-19 um, uh, come together then. Um, but we're keeping that under very close review, so I just wanted to reassure the board of that. Um, secondly, my report mentions the surveys that we've undertaken of local authorities on the impact of COVID-19 to date and their resourcing. And we got the, uh, the closing date for that was on Friday. We've done some very initial analysis, and I should emphasise this is still very, very early. But it confirms the intelligence that we've had from local authorities through our established engagement mechanisms um, that a lot of resource has been diverted onto other priorities. Um, so on average, across the local authorities that responded, the number of professional posts for dealing with food safety work has been reduced to less than half in England and to around three quarters in Northern Ireland due to redeployment of staff to, to other COVID-19 related activities. But there is wide variation around those averages. Um, so in some cases, the impact is hugely significant. In other cases, obviously far less so. In Wales, there's been a reduction in the number of staff available to undertake food official controls and data from a subset of local authorities suggests that there's been a 70% decrease in staff available to undertake food controls. Um, and we think that over the six months since lockdown, the number of food hygiene interventions that were overdue at the start of 2020-21 has doubled in both England and Northern Ireland. Um, in Wales, local, local authorities have indicated that the majority of the work being undertaken is re in relation to reactive imminent risk work, as well as food poisoning investigations. Now, we have given guidance all the way through the pandemic to local authorities to prioritise the highest risk uh, food interventions. And we believe those are continuing, but obviously there is a backlog of less of lower priority work. And we're going to be completing our analysis of the survey responses in the next few days. And then we'll review our current advice to local authorities in the light of that. Um, we're, we're very conscious that there have been significant changes in the shape of the food industry in the last few months, um, with restaurants and cafes and takeaways closed and then reopening, uh, many changing their business models, um, many new businesses starting up. Uh, and it's essential that public, the public can have food that they trust. Um, we think the local authority role in supporting and guiding these businesses and assessing their safe practices is key to public confidence in the food industry and especially the hospitality sector. So obviously keeping a very close eye on this. So that was on the survey. Um, I mentioned uh, health and identity marks in the report and we had the question this morning um, from the International Meat uh, Trade Association. Um, and I noted that we have been working with other government departments to find solutions to the challenges of applying new markings and labels to food. I know how much the food industry and meat industry have wanted clarity on this. And I just want to apologize that the legal complexities of this have taken us some time to work through. So the update is that today we're recommending to health ministers in England that a 21 month period of adjustment is applied that will allow the GB industry to continue using packaging and wrapping materials that carry the UK EC identification mark after the transition period finishes for products of animal origin destined for the GB market. Um, we've recommended this for identification marks only, so not health marks, to allow industry to use remaining packing stocks, carrying the old mark and reduce the economic burden of changes in labelling requirements. We're not considering a period of adjustment for health marks as they are applied at the point of slaughter and the changeover is straightforward. So there are no stocks of packaging to acquire or to use up. 
although some practical flexibilities may be required to ensure continuity of supply. If ministers approve our recommendation, we will need to amend a 2019 statutory instrument for England. Um, in Wales, we will be making the same recommendations to ministers in relation to health and ID marks, but the submission runs at a slightly slower pace as we're also requesting ministers agree to apply the 20 month, 21 month adjustment period for ID marks and general labelling, and that will also require a small change in the law. Um, it's also our intention to allow businesses to use labels and packaging with the new identification mark before the end of the transition period, as long as appropriate safeguards are in place to prevent pre-labeled stock being placed on the market. So overall, we consider that the food safety risk is very low to the approach that we're describing because because all products bearing either the old or new health and identification marks will have been produced to the same high standards and under the same safe and hygienic conditions. And with controls in place, traceability requirements can be met. Now that that leaves Northern Ireland, our legal advice is that legislative periods of adjustments are not applicable for the Northern Ireland market under the terms of the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland protocol. So we're still looking into this. We've requested further legal advice and we're working closely with DEFRA to ensure we fully explore any flexibilities we can for the Northern Ireland market and Northern Ireland businesses. Um, so that's an update on the policy proposition. The guidance that was asked for, we, we hope to publish this by the end of September um, so that we can be clear in that, what, uh, in detail, what I've updated you with today. So that's all I wanted to say, Chair, on my report. Thank you. Emily, thank you very much. Uh, board members, um, I think we'll all be uh, relieved that we've managed to get to that point in terms of clarity on health marks. Are there any other points anybody wish to raise with the Chief Exec? I have got uh, Mark, Rolf, and then Dave Brooks. Thank you, Heather, and, and Emily, thank you for your report. Um, I just wanted to ask if I might about the EU transition part uh, of your report. Um, and you, you've, you've covered in there the, the staged uh, inbound checks that are going to happen between uh, the end of the transition period and July. What I'm, what I'm concerned about is, is, is there an open door at, at some particularly the short straight ports between the end of the transition period and July? Or will there be any kind of sort of market surveillance carried out uh, to ensure that people are actually not trying to sneak non-compliant goods from the EU into this country during that period? Emily, do you want to pick that one up right away? Or so, um, so we've always said that we think that the level of risk on day one is the same as the level of risk on day zero. Um, and we have been, uh, but we've been keen to make sure that the controls come in gradually because obviously there is a risk you described, Mark. Um, we have uh, very sophisticated surveillance going on on a daily basis with our ability to scan data and look for signals um, in, uh, in, in ports. Um, and Julie Pierce or Paul Morrison could say a little bit more about if uh, about that if that would be helpful. Julie, Paul, does one of you want to come in there? Just very briefly, yes. Um, the surveillance approach um, has been established for a while now, um, and so I think it is pretty well exercised, um, and um, it will be operating. Um, over the coming the coming months, and also we will be always looking to see whether we need to enhance it. Um, so whether or not it is <clears throat> absolutely fit for purpose, I'm not sure, but we will um, we will be soon be able to find out. I'm happy to provide Mark with more detail if needed. I think that would be useful. Is that a good Mark? I'm looking at you to see if you're happy with that. Yeah, that that would be great, Julie. Thank you. My my concern is that if I was a if I was a nefarious food business in the EU, the uh, the the new open Dover route would be a great way of getting your stuff out of the EU if it was non-compliant. And I just want to make sure that we covered that risk. Dave, thanks, Heather. Um, four questions, two sort of linked. Um, in in paragraph one, um, we refer to our plan program. Uh, 
not being returned to uh, fully yet. And obviously, uh, Emily's just updated us on the uh, potential for having to step up our COVID work again in December. Um, do we have a um, target date of when we will be able to return to our planned programme of work? Um, and if it is going to be delayed into 2021, is that creating um, undue risk um, on some of that work being delayed? On a similar vein, um, we talk about the local authorities in paragraph nine and obviously the update you've just given us, uh, Emily, of only half the workforce being available to do food inspections does cause some concern. I suppose how long do we think that can be sustained without creating an unacceptable level of risk in the food system, particularly given the, the turbulence and changes that you spoke about as well in your report? Um Paragraph 15, uh, we talk about the Northern Ireland Protocol, IPAFs and the risks here to delivery. Um, at what point or what date will those risks become reality if they're not resolved? And finally, um, paragraph 23, where we talk about the small business sampling on Campylobacter. Um, do we intend to publish that data? And if so, when? Thank you. I think uh, while Emily might work out who she wants to field those, uh, we'll just we'll take Ruth and Colm's comments. Oh, we'll put the comments are coming in left, right, and centre now. Um, okay, Ruth, Colm, and Margaret. Ruth first. Thank you, um, Emily. I, I just wanted to pick up that local authority uh, update you gave us um, on the back of Dave's comments as well. Um, the the impact seems quite uh, significant, and obviously the sector itself has been under immense uh, difficulty and pressure. Um, given the importance of recovering that position and strengthening the capability at local level, uh, is it possible that you will feed this sort of information into the comprehensive spending review so that we uh, get a, a strong uh, input, if you like, in terms of what local government needs going forward? Thank you. Colm? Uh, actually, my, my two questions have been covered a little bit by, by both uh, Dave and Ruth. I, I think certainly the first one was really on, on the update from Emily on the local authorities uh, and concerned, obviously, with, with the base. But what are, what, what are local authorities doing to address that themselves? And what can we do to help local authorities address that? Because obviously the problem comes back to roost with us. And my second question was around uh, the health marks and identification marks for Northern Ireland and the complications around that. Uh, and is everybody who needs to be as seized of this as we are, uh, uh, certainly in, in the devolved area, as seized, where are we working well with Dara and so forth and the people we need to work with in Northern Ireland? While I appreciate uh, things like Northern Ireland qualifying good definitions still need to be hammered out. Thanks, Colm. And I'll just take Margaret's question and then we'll wrap all that up. Um, all covered, just one tiny point not um, covered by colleagues, which is uh, on paragraph 15, where you refer to um, the protocol requiring design decisions. I just wondered what you meant by that. Emily, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good set of questions, keeping us on our toes. Thank you very much. Um, so the when questions from Dave. So, um, uh, when do we return? When do we plan to return to our previous plan of work? I don't think we can say that yet. Um, the pandemic is uncertain, volatile, uh, is affecting us in unexpected ways. So we are having to be as agile and nimble as we can in the way that we prioritise our work. At the moment, though, the preparation that we're doing to prepare for the end of the transition period is taking up a significant amount of senior bandwidth, legal time and policy time. So my hope is that come the end of January, when we've made that transition into the new world, we've got the new import controls in place, we're operating our new risk analysis process. My hope is that from February, we will be able to start uh, allocating our resources again to some of those big priorities, assuming that the pandemic continues um, to get worse over the next period. If it, however, flattens out and we are in a more stable situation, we may be able to return to that programme of work sooner. Um, but it is it, it, the constraints are not just um, uh, people um, at more junior levels. It is very much also about strategic direction and senior bandwidth at the most senior levels too. And, can, and 
Yeah. yeah, I was just going to come in on that if I could, uh, because uh, uh, Emily and I and uh, uh, Deputy Chair Ruth and uh, Robin as our CSA discussed this in one of our monthly catch-ups yesterday. And I think the anxiety is, is as much about the ability of the senior leadership team to continue to operate in the midst of all these strains and stresses and to have the resilience as things get more difficult through into the winter. Um, and we are at a situation now where the, the other things on our agenda are really important to us and really important to the longer term protections we can put in place for public health. So it's it's very disappointing, but I think we have to be realistic about the need to maintain capacity and spirit and strength and resilience in our in our senior team uh, to be able to take all of these things forward. Otherwise, they're constantly being treated as side of desk activities and they need full focus to to make a material amount of progress not ideal but but where we are i mean the other, the other thing i would add is that there have been a couple of places where we've done what we've tried to do what we call double duty so where we know where we're trying to head for example on operational transformation or on trying to support local authorities to to um use their resources in a, in a cuter way um focused on risk and we've basically been using the um easements or the changes that we're doing through the pandemic to try out those future possibilities so where we can where we can we're, we're, we're doing that but it's obviously we need to focus on the urgent as well as the important um, on the local authorities point i mean this this data obviously is quite new um, I, I was just sent the analysis this morning we got the survey results last friday we're going to have to do a lot of digging through it making sure that our analysis is accurate and then thinking through how we um how we approach this with local authorities um, and, and I'd quite like Maria to comment on this as well, um, if possible. I think um, it, it is obviously very concerning. Uh, we have been um, taking a very proportionate approach over the last few months and advising local authorities to um, focus on the absolute highest risk because we knew that resourcing was tight. Um, and we will, we will continue looking at ways of doing the job differently. If there is less resource, are there more digital or technical ways that we can support the assessment of risk um, but obviously it is concerning um, and how long do we think that can be sustained I think that's some of the analysis that we need to, to think through. I'm going to ask um, Paul to pick up the Northern Ireland protocol points and Maria may want to put a codicil to that too um, and Ruth's question about uh, local authorities just to dot around slightly um, we I, I think we will be uh, feeding this information to the spending review it's not the FSA that bids for money on behalf of local authorities for this piece. It's the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government because food controls are paid for through the general grant that goes to local authorities. So we are also making um, our representations to the to MHCLG, but we, we will be giving that information both to the Treasury and MHCLG. But the way of resolving it is for the Treasury to give um, a different grant to MHCLG. Um, in the meantime, we carry on monitoring and we will have a regular update on the escalation procedure in place, won't we? Because, because we've set that up. And even though local authorities, we understand why they um, are struggling for resources, that doesn't mean that we won't keep telling them that they're not resourcing and delivering the outcomes that we need them to deliver. Yeah. Um, I'll need to ask Rebecca to ask, answer the question on Campyla Back to Data and whether we're publishing... Um, and Colm's question about the Northern Ireland health marks. So it, I, I do feel that people are very seized of this. There's a lot of a lot of lawyers and a lot of policy people extremely engaged in the question because we know how urgent it is for business. It's just really difficult to resolve. Um, and the, the legal constraints are quite clear and we're trying to find as many flexibilities as we can, but obviously we need to stick within the rule of law. Um, should, if I could hand over to Maria to pick up uh, yeah. Sorry, let's start with Paul to talk about Northern Ireland Protocol and then go to Maria to talk about local authorities and any other Northern Ireland points. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I'm, I'm going to answer both Margaret and Dave's uh, questions at the same time. So, uh, Margaret, the, the specific uh, issues are around the IT and it's around the decisions that are going to need to be made by DERA working with DEFRA around um, how the systems for managing imports in Northern Ireland are going to interact with the EU systems, because obviously we've got the, the IPAFs, and then the added complication of the Northern Ireland Protocol is, is that question of how it, it, it works with the EU systems. And what we're, what we're doing is, well, the reason we need to know it is because we need to know what systems the staff that are 
being brought in and being trained are, are going to be operating on. So they've got clarity around how that's practically going to work. We are, as I say, we're feeding into the, you know, the daily almost the technical information to the teams and the other government departments who are, who are working on the IT design, and and we are very much plugged into that. But but Dave, the, the purpose in that, the risk is that there are you know that that those conversations and those design uh, discussions are happening at the moment. We are plugging in and making sure that the, they have the maximum chance of being successful. It's not that they don't happen and then there's a period of time where you know we're worried about it. The, the mitigation we want at the moment is, is to make sure that some of those very detailed issues are addressed and give, give us a, a bit of a run-in for the, the people who are going to be operating the systems to be able to operate them. Um, and yeah, and as Emily said, Maria, I don't know if you want to uh, add uh, to anything I've just said. Very happy to, Paul, thank you. Um, it, it, yes, there, it, it is quite a complicated scenario and I think we um, have been very careful to make sure that all of the government departments in Northern Ireland are joined up. Um, this is a project that is led by DARA, um, but I um, sit on their um, programme board, which is managed by their permanent secretary. And also then I have um, my team plugged into all of the different operational um, uh, meetings and uh, groups that meet, uh, working with local authorities, working with all of the other government departments to try to make sure that we have this system in place in time. But it is hugely, hugely complex and there are still outstanding questions that need to be answered as well. And those questions are also in the political domain. So um, I think, you know, we can't underestimate the, um, the challenges that we face here. Um, are you happy, Heather, for me to pick up on the local authority issues? Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, just to add, Emily has covered nearly everything, but just to add that we're also trying to support local authorities in relation to the resources that they have in terms of the competency framework that we're developing. And you know that we're fast tracking that competency framework to make sure that um, local authorities have at their disposal the, the people with the skills that they require to do different jobs within the system, and that will help to alleviate some of the pressures. Um, but as you know, um, we continue to talk about local authorities taking action to add value. So every intervention that they make should add value. And that's why we're really prioritizing local authorities, um, putting, putting in place, their, putting their resources to deal with the highest risk issues that we're facing at the minute. Thank you very much. And on Rebecca, on the Campy publication. Yes, uh, yes, thanks for your question, Dave. Um, yes, we do publish the minor retailer figures. So I believe that those figures are just being verified at the moment. So they'll be published in the normal way. Thanks. And Julie, I think you wanted to come in on one of those points. Yes, <clears throat> just going back to the local authority um, point, um, we're having similar resource funding conversations with Welsh Government as, as we are with um, English ministers. Thank you very much. I think that's in the Chief Exec's report. Save for, I just wanted to uh, let the board know, we've talked on a couple of occasions around the board uh, meeting in terms of uh, the uh, future of um, public confidence in uh, food standards and maintaining those food standards. And that's obviously had a lot of airtime and uh, media coverage over the last few months. Um, and picking up the board's reflections, um, uh, as you know, the FSA can advise ministers on any issue in relation to consumers' interests in food. What I've asked Emily as our chief executive to do is to develop proposals for a regular published assessment that would offer an FSA view on the state of play on food standards generally, and that would include on consumer interests in relation to food standards. Uh, so she's going to work on that. Officials will bring an update to the board on this next year with setting out their intentions in more detail. But I think you know, the board has said it wants to make this commitment to this, to this published um, assessment. It's a very important commitment we can make in terms of openness and transparency public assurance in an, an emotive and a high profile area that's of wide public interest. So I hope that will be a valuable addition, uh, but obviously more work needs to be done on the scope and shape and nature of that assessment and that report. So more will be coming forward to the board next year on that. 
unless anybody else is waving at me, we are going to move on. Thank you very much. So our next paper is being introduced by uh, Rebecca Sudworth. I think Theo Hawkins is also going to be joining us. And uh, it's on the Food and Feed Safety and Hygiene Common Framework update. Uh, Rebecca, over to you. Yes, actually, I think it's uh, Paul who's going to do the general introduction to this. And, yes, uh, you did and say that. I'm so sorry. On the detail. Yes. It's very much, thank you, Chair, and it does actually reflect the very much the, uh, the team effort that's going on in here, and there, there has been an awful lot of uh, work. So um, it, just in introducing, I actually wanted to do two things. One, just introduce the paper and the decision that's in front of the board, but because of the very fast moving nature of that, I also wanted to spend a bit of time updating the, the board in particular on the um, you, the, the, the events around the UK internal market. Um, so I'll, I'll do both of those things. But just to start by uh, introducing the paper, it's uh, it's an update on the progress around the common frameworks on uh, food feed uh, uh, safety and hygiene. Um, and this is something that the FSA uh, delivers on, uh, leads on. And we are asking today for the you know the the board's agreement around how we're going to take the next stage in terms of the uh, advice we're going to be providing to ministers for around the uh, around the frameworks. So just to re re recap, they are a, you know really key element of the intergovernmental um, post uh, transition uh, landscape, and the idea is that they will put ways of working to allow the four countries in the UK to work together effectively post uh, the end of the transition period. Um, once they're agreed, they will be um, a formal agreement between the UK government and devolved administrations. They'll be signed by ministers um, uh, and they will sign up to joint working practices uh, in the area of food, uh, feed, safety and hygiene uh, after December 2020 when the transition period ends. Um, the, uh, the arrangements uh, between the two organisations, the FSA and uh, uh, FSS, um, will be captured in an MOU and that will be implemented through the joint ways of working uh, across the four countries which is set out in the framework and um, broadly as the paper says i think progress is uh, going well and we are on track to have an agreement uh, in in time by the end of uh, december 2020 and the reason we are the, the timing of this update is um, uh, just to do prior to the final um, review and assessment process um, which is set out by the uh, the joint project board we have overseeing this work um, in terms of developing the, the common frameworks and doing so before we get to the next stage, which as I mentioned uh, earlier was is around uh, uh, seeking ministerial agreement to the to the framework and this is the opportunity just to to seek the board's uh, you know agreement to that. So very briefly, there are four things within that ask that uh, we are we are making of the board today. One, uh, just to confirm that we've retained our strategic alignment with the um, uh, with the strategic objectives for transition, which the, the paper reminds us of, um, and we've we've been developing the approach in in line with that. Um, secondly, just to check in again uh, around the role of the board moving forward in terms of the way that the framework is going to operate, which uh, the paper describes as the the assurance you're going to uh, the board is going to receive uh, that uh, if the framework is functioning uh, effectively and um, the business committee uh, in future being provided via multiple av avenues um, at various different uh, uh, means of uh, deriving that assurance and also about the uh, the, the board's um, visibility of the uh, outcome of any bilateral conversations between the two chairs of the FSA and the FSS. So that's the that's the that's the ask that's in the paper. But as I said, um, the way that the world is moving at pace means that there have been uh, uh, developments since the paper was drafted, and I just wanted very briefly uh, to to take those uh, take the board through those. So um, uh, the key focus uh, of effort in recent days has been the UK uh, Internal Market Bill, which um, uh, you will have uh, picked up is passing through or has passed through its second reading in Parliament. And you know, the, the primary purpose of the bill is to commit the four countries uh, to apply two particular principles in the uh, uh, in the delivery in this area, in, which does, it covers all sectors, but will capture food and feed as well. And that's the principle of mutual recognition, the idea, the concept that goods and services marketed lawfully in one country 
uh, under one regulatory system are presumed to meet the equivalent regulatory standards in other systems and also non-discrimination which is around uh, making uh, preventing one regulatory system introducing rules which specifically dis discriminates against goods and services uh, from another uh, regulatory system covered by another regulatory system and the um just to do reflect on how that plays out into the, the frameworks uh, areas, we we think that the framework and the risk analysis pro, uh, process it commits all of us to across uh, the, the different countries um, uh, is a really important element in making the uh, you know the, the internal market proposals work and ensure that they don't you know inhibit the FSA's ability to operate. Um, uh, and protect consumers from unsafe food um, and also that it works effectively uh, across uh, devolved legislation um, and it's really that framework and the ways of working uh, in that we are we think are really important in mitigating the risks around the different regulatory approaches uh, and mean that the recommendation to the board uh, from us is that the application of mutual recognition and non uh, discrimination are not problematic for the continuing delivery of our objectives. The, the one thing I did want to just highlight to the, the board was though, that we identified one area uh, which uh, in you know is, is, is part of the bill uh, relating to the risk of the ability for the Food uh, Standards Agency to take quick emergency uh, 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 responses to emerging uh, food and food issues and to allow uh, ministers in all four countries to act quickly enough in public health interests. Um, they, uh, we've worked with Bayes, uh, who are the lead department for the bill, to secure a narrow exclusion from the principles of mutual recognition. Um, and this exclusion would be available when there's a public health uh, emergency and when there's a need to take urgent action. Um, and so I think that you know that exemption allows us to reinforce the assurance that we can give to the board that where there's unforeseen serious risk to health, we have the means, uh, or ministers have the means of taking the appropriate action. Um, so I just wanted to, to provide that advice because it is relevant to the, the frameworks. I think the frameworks uh, allow us to give some reassurance around how the legislation is going to work and the additional uh, uh, exemption that we're talking about in the uh, in the legislation, you know, provides us, uh, I think, with a, with a strong basis to move forward. So that was all I was going to say, uh, Chair, by way of introduction. And as Rebecca said, and Theo's here, we can we can pick up more detailed comments in any questions. Thank you very much, Paul. And I have written to ministers in our three countries explaining uh, that uh, the risk of divergence, of course, uh, remains, and there's a likelihood of that risk materialising. But the level of confidence we have in the arrangements around the frameworks being a mechanism to uh, mitigate or minimise those risks and also reiterating the point about the ability to act swiftly in the event of a food or feed health crisis. Uh, so I'm very glad to have that Minister's recognition of the importance of that. Dave. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and thanks, Theo, for, for the uh, work on this. Um, can, can we just clarify what it actually means? Because I'm not sure if I'm totally understanding it. I might be, but let, let's just check for a second. So this framework allows for each of the four individual countries to make their own decisions um, based upon the risks that um, are identified through the risk assessment process. Um, should they make different decisions, um, there's kind of a uh, secondary phase that enables us to try and resolve those to bring those decisions back into line so that we've got commonality. However, should they continue to make different decisions, product made in England, for argument's sake, could be sold in Scotland, even if Scotland weren't allowed to make it in Scotland themselves. Is that a correct understanding of how the devolution framework and um, mutual recognition of the UK internal market works uh, and if it is how, how would that apply to where we've already got divergence on something like raw drinking milk um, because that would allow that then to be made in Carlisle and sold in Edinburgh potentially um, and my second question is the board role in, in practice 
does the framework actually change the board role or is it really just the same as it is normally in that we we assess the risk analysis we offer advice to ministers ministers make the decisions um replacing i suppose the european union in that um and then we just kind of monitor to ensure that we've got appropriate assurance through that process thank you cool so um so, so broadly speaking dave yes that's right but on the point of the existing um uh, regulatory differences they won't be covered by the uk uh, internal market bill um, so it, it, it's um, uh, it, moving forward, they will be covered by the framework. The, the assurance that we, we are providing is that because we are so kind of working hard and aligning between ourselves, the FSA and the FSS and the different agreements between how it's going to work, that the, the, the risks associated with you know, that divergent conversation are, are low. That's the assurance we're giving you. But the, the, the premise that you're setting is correct, but just to be specific on the on the existing uh, differences, they're not covered. So, so just coming back, so in reality, a business would only need approval or, or a, a product or um, process would only need approval for one of the four devolved governments to be available across the whole of the UK. Yeah, but I think the, the key is, Dave, is the way the, the framework and the Concord Act that covers the arrangements of working between officials and between ministers means that you know, while there, you know, there is that risk, as you say, of you know, there being divergence, that while it will be to one of the uh, four uh, countries, we will be working very uh, closely and aligning a lot of the, the ways that we go around it and the risk uh, analysis that goes into the decisions. Okay, uh, and I suppose it's probably unwise to, given the sensitivity at the moment, to touch on the impact that has on Northern Ireland when it's operating under EU rules. Well, it makes it a lot more complicated, it does, that's for it sure. Does. It does. Um, and um, uh, we, so. You're right, Dave. That is a complication. Conversations with Northern Ireland will continue as uh, and be involved in all the processes and discussions. So the implementation of decisions in Northern Ireland, they will be limited by the Northern Ireland Protocol. So that is your right to, to pick that up as an uh, additional complication. I don't know, uh, Maria or Rebecca, if you wanted to add to anything. Well, before before we get back into that, I'll take some more questions. That's all right, Paul. Um, and I would just say, I think. This has always been part of the system that we have been developing in terms of the, the regime that's going to operate post uh, EU exit and post transition. But inevitably, now it's becoming closer and realer. There's a lot more attention on it. But this UK framework, and, and there are several of them, obviously, that, that apply to us, has always been a, an element of the way in which the system that we've designed was going to work. Um, it's just that the realities of how it's going to operate now become clearer. I've got Margaret and then Colm. Take both of you and then um, we'll go back to officials. Um, Paul, thank you very much. I think you've uh, made it really clear there. Um, and I hear what you're saying, um, giving us assurances that you believe the risks are low. Um, but ultimately it is for ministers to make decisions on our advice. And you have raised in paragraphs 315 and 316, this issue that you could um, theoretically have a situation where um, the FSA is advised um, uh, one thing and minister uh, that something's unsafe, but ministers sort of overrule that. And you say that you're working on mitigating options. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about those. Um, and we'll take Colm's question as well, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. And Paul, thank you and Theo for the paper. Uh, really, really clear, really good paper. <clears throat> obviously, some of the questions, uh, uh, we're not, I'm not expecting an answer around the Northern Ireland one. That's obviously an issue, but I, I am keen to understand uh, how it, it may work in terms of the Northern Ireland input to that, given that there could be quite a different regime. Uh, the other question for me was around the uh, the dispute resolution, the dispute resolution I read to be between ourselves and FSS in the first instance. But what role do we play if there is divergent views by, by ministers in trying to uh, facilitate that? And could we get dragged in inadvertently uh, to uh, an area of politics we're quite keen to stay away from? 
Thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Paula and others may want to come in. Uh, but just to say, I do think we, we must recognise that it seems very unlikely that ministers are going to take a decision which will compromise food safety. This is about the scale and scope of mitigation measures to ensure everybody has got the best possible protection in particular groups, particular approaches. I think we've got to be careful not to suggest that a minister in any country of, of the UK is, is going to allow unsafe food to be placed on the market. Yeah, Paul. Thank you. Yes, and I was I was going to, um, you know, reference the you know the, the the advice going will be around that those core issues that uh, the, the organisations have, and you know, as you say, chair, uh, there is that you know that that mitigation inherent in it. I was wondering if, if I might bring Theo in uh, just to talk in a, a bit more detail about the ways of working and and some of the mitigations in in answer to uh, the further questions, Theo. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, it, it, in response to, to Margaret's question around, um, I think it was paragraph 315 and the, the further mitigations, um, we were referring there to the work that we've been doing with Bayes on the UK internal market exclusion for food safety. Um, and the, the reason that wasn't in the paper is that, that that work's been moving so quickly that at the point at which we were drafting it, we, we didn't ha yet have confirmation if that was going to be in the bill that's now been published. Um, the exclusion in the UK internal market bill for food, food safety is in a very specific set of circumstances as the, the conditions outlined um, set out. Um, they, uh, it, it, it's there to ensure that ministers in any one of the four countries can act quickly and comprehensively in the event of a serious risk to human health. And so it's not that we would be expecting you know, um, any ministers to be uh, taking or, or taking steps that would be, as Heather was saying, uh, taking decisions to put unsafe food on the market. It's just to ensure that if there were different approaches or you know d different speeds of reaction, that ministers' powers aren't aren't constrained, and that that exclusion gives them the ability to act there, um, and that excludes the, the the mutual recognition principle. And um, so we feel that you know the majority of the time, because the the pace of the the way in which um, you know legislation works, we the common framework and the ways of working that we've put in place will be adequate medication. But in those you know emergency situations, with the need to act very quickly, the, there is that exclusion from mutual recognition, the ability to act. Robin, thank you, Heather. Yes, just perhaps quickly to add from from my perspective that obviously a lot of this conversation has been around uh, a regulatory impact and, and policy quite rightly uh, but obviously the thing that uh, is also important to bring out from the framework I think is that it provides a, a formalized interaction between the four nations also in terms of data and information sharing at, at official level which I think is really critical um, to keep in mind so not just in terms of that reactionary responding to events but in, in future gazing and, and surveillance um, because as we know you know things like uh, foodborne pathogens don't respect borders um, and it's really important I think that that's now written down in black and white that we there will be an exchange of information regardless of what ministers might decide in terms of implementing policy the the, the regimes in each of the countries will have that foresight to be able to plan accordingly. Ruth. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to emphasise um, the uh, point that was made at the Welsh Food Advisory Committee, which I chaired um, uh, last week, uh, was the commitment to um, evidence-based decision-making and transparency and openness and uh, how strongly they felt that um, that was such a key part of this whole process of operating the frameworks. And it was just to in endorse and welcome that approach. Our input will be on an evidence-based and science-based and open and transparent basis. The operation of the frameworks is a matter for the UK government, so they'll be in control of the extent of openness and transparency there. Um, and I think we should also bear in mind here in terms of this, this risk of divergence. There's already divergence, as, as Dave's pointed out with the raw milk issue. There, divergence is possible today and ministers can take different decisions about the way in which um, they accept our advice, what we're trying to do. And, and I do think that this is, there's no um, drive at the moment from any of the administrations we work in to, to deliberately 
cause a difference in relation to food safety or standards for the sake of it. So, and local circumstances can make quite a difference in some situations. So I think we're, whilst the internal market creates this issue and this risk, I think we should focus on everything we're doing to make sure that the science and evidence that we gather, the consumer insight that we gather, the way we present that material, our understanding of the, the three nations that we operate in and our close relationship with Food Standards Scotland makes it as unlikely as it possibly can be that divergence is going to happen for the sake of it. But ultimately, this has always been an area of ministerial decision making and will continue to be an area of ministerial decision making and food continues to be a devolved issue. So some of that is just going to be, um, um, I suppose, a um, more visible part of the current normal in the new normal, Tim. Thank you. Um, I guess, I mean, you, you just picked it up very helpfully, Heather. I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful for the explanation given. I understand the complexities and also some of the uncertainties, particularly when we're trying to have a, a system that hopefully will re be robust about risk to help us identify where there could be significant concerns and hopefully anticipate them and attend to them. Um, I guess this is just kind of to um, flag perhaps for a future board discussion, just that we are thinking about the systems to identify where there may be exceptions and divergence, both as a learning exercise, um, but also that appropriate measures can be taken and I, I suppose that was underscored for me this morning because I, I wasn't um, originally going to be able to make the ball but I, luckily I, I, I got back in time um, but I was actually at uh, Dublin to Holyhead last night at half past three in the morning and I was watching the food trucks from three different countries come through and I was just thinking how the controls were going to be exercised in the scenarios we were talking about here because at the operational level it's always a lag between what's agreed within a framework such as this and what people understand and implement on the ground. So it's really that we do get to come back to this and, and discuss those issues. Thank you. Tim, I have absolutely no doubt that they're going to form a central part of every agenda for, uh, for the foreseeable future. I think, and the, just to reiterate, this, it was really useful to have this discussion and, and it's an opportunity for us to just highlight this framework um, uh, arrangement and the way that the frameworks are going to operate. Um, it's, it's a much bigger decision that's been taken by the UK government in terms of these, uh, the, the way in which the internal market is going to be managed and the common framework approach across many, many areas that are devolved, but where a cohesive approach is thought to be uh, in the uh, public interest. So, for the board there's no particular decision to take at this point save that um, we recognize the role we're going to play we endorse and support that role um, and we see that the uh, the uh, food and feed safety and hygiene common framework is a constructive mechanism to try to mitigate any risks of divergence which are unwarranted or don't serve the consumer interest and that being said I think we will move on. Nobody else is looking like they want to say anything. So we're moving on now to another element of our preparation for a life beyond the transition period, which is an update on our risk analysis process, which definitely is Rebecca and uh, Phil Flart is also being involved here. This, I think very usefully, this is coming back to the board um, uh, after our discussions in uh, recent board meetings about the risk analysis uh, process and particularly the need to stand up the um, uh, uh, advisory structure uh, that we put in uh, in terms of uh, being ready for the delegation of risk management decisions to the FSA. Uh, so it's a good loop back to the board in terms of confirming the board's instructions but I'll hand over to Rebecca now. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, and I think that this this leads on really nicely, actually, from that last discussion, because this um, this is uh, our update to the board on progress in uh, the design and delivery of the risk analysis process. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, this is all about how the FSA is going to assess food safety risk and how we're going to formulate recommendations to ministers about how to manage that risk. Um, and uh, you know we, we work as one FSA, we provide recommendations to ministers in the different administrations, obviously as we've discussed previously, 
they take decisions, uh, but we have a very robust and transparent process that uh, that will underpin that from, from next January. So um, we, as Heather says, we've been providing regular updates to the board on our progress in designing and implementing the risk analysis process. And this paper um, focuses in particular on two aspects um, where we have some more detail to fill in and where the board is taking a particular interest uh, around how issues will be prioritized in the process and also uh, looking at transparency and publication and uh, placing, uh, placing the relevant information in the public domain. Um, and as we've seen from the previous discussion, having that robust and transparent approach uh, not only demonstrates that we meet the very highest international standards in our approach to, to risk analysis, um, but demonstrates also how, um, how we are approaching three country working in respect to the FSA and four country working in our relationship with FSS as well. Uh, and as we've discussed, you know, we have a great track record here of really joined up and collaborative working. Uh, across all four nations, actually, which we intend to continue. So I'm now going to hand over to Phil, um, who will talk you through some of the, the detail in the paper, particularly around prioritisation and publication, as, uh, as we've discussed, where we'll be asking the board to agree the, um, the proposals for the approach. Phil. Cool. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I think on the uh, prioritisation side, I mean, I think the the main thing to get across, and this, this you know, is it comes across in the paper, hopefully, is that of course public health protection will be the the key thing, and that will be taken into account at every step of the process. Um, the thing we've been looking at, and I know this was discussed at the board in January, is with the the high volume of issues that we're expecting to be going through the systems, and particularly with you know the high volume of, of product authorizations that, that we may well get. Um, how do we go about identifying those that are non-routine? You know, the vast majority of these will be will be routine issues. They will not be um, of particular uh, concern either politically or from a public health impact um, uh, perspective. So, how do we identify those that, that need a greater greater level of, of scrutiny? So, the paper sets out our approach for for doing that. So, how we'll identify these, these non-routine issues, which could be where you know, there's a, as I said, there's a concern about the public health implications, perhaps, or there's, there's a greater level of political interest. And the, the point where you might identify an issue that's, that's going into the system as, as non-routine, um, I mean, in some cases, it might be apparent immediately. So, you know, the minute you receive an authorization request or the minute you start considering an issue, it might be apparent that actually this is, this is non-routine, this is not standard, uh, this is not a standard issue. Well, in other cases, it might come to light a bit later in the process, or it might be that you know uh, politics develops, or that you know the uh, the issue becomes difficult as a result of the evidence that's being generated through the risk assessment. So the approach that we're taking or proposing is sensitive to that. You know, it'll be led by specific officials. There'll be a prioritisation board that will look at these issues and will have a challenge function for where they think things have changed or moved on, and those there uh, on on specific issues. And of course, being able to identify a non-routine issue at the earliest point will will mean that we can then handle it appropriately. So that would include, you know, uh, the conversations that we'll need to be having with other government departments and the devolved administrations, uh, and also, of course, with the FSA board where where that's appropriate. Uh, there's the in, in, there's the also the uh, point around prioritizing uh, prioritizing the issues. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's an additional step, if you like, from the uh, identification of those that are non-routine. Um, so what is the, you know, we, we will also look to, to prioritise them as we go through the system. Uh, so, they probably, you know, so they all progress at an appropriate pace, whether or not they're routine or non-routine. So, you know, is, is, uh, the kind of issues we'll be looking at there are, you know, is it a legal requirement? What are the implications for public health, et cetera, et cetera? How quickly can this be done? Is it difficult? So that will help help us work where the resources are best spent to get things done quickly but that's a slightly separate point to which ones which issues we think are non-routine and therefore need that, that greater level of uh, scrutiny uh, the paper also talks about the uh our proposed approach with the, the northern ireland protocol where and and you know this was being discussed earlier of course where the eu risk management decisions uh, based on European Food Safety Authority opinions, will, will in most cases uh, continue to apply under the for Northern Ireland Protocol. So the paper sets out how we intend to continue to consider the interests of, of consumers in Northern Ireland, such as when we triage an issue like 
uh, a new EU regulation as being non-routine. So, you know, again, whether we have a concern about the public health implications or there's significant political interest. Uh, and in those cases, we will continue to consider those issues for risk assessment and they will be prioritised accordingly either against the other issues that we have in the pot. And that will help us in terms of our, our messaging or in terms of perhaps raising concerns on the terms of the protocol if that's, if that's, uh, if that's um, appropriate to do so. The other thing the paper covers is publication. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. It's, you know, the paper sets out how the risk analysis process fits within the FSA's commitment to openness uh, and transparency, of course, is also important in, in an international setting given the UK's upcoming obligations as a, as a WCO member. Um, it's, it sets out our commitment to publishing our advice to ministers and the underpinning evidence and also for carrying out meaningful consultation. Uh, and that the board will be kept regularly updated with a quarterly list of issues and also the questions that we will be considering will be published on the FSA website for everyone to see. So we've really tried to embed transparency throughout the system. Can I, I think that's just a quick overview. I'll pass back to Rebecca. I'm quite keen actually that we get into some board discussion because there's quite a yeah. long introduction if we possibly can. So if I can just try and sort of make sure we focus on the things that really that are really new or, or different here. So board, just forgive me for this. I think we asked you to come back with the triage system and that does reflect the conversation that there's been at the board. So unless board members think that there's something wrong in that, I, I, I think we're probably fine with that. I'd also like us just to confirm that the risk analysis flowchart that you've updated and attached, the board did ask that that would have the uh, commitments to publication of material on it. And I think it's very important that that happens. That has been a board discussion and decision. So if we could get them back on that chart, I think that would be really useful. Just as a point of clarification, the route for publicising, uh, publish, publishing our advice is, is not usually going to be through the FSA board because the vast majority of these issues are technical process authorisations and this board is not going to spend its time on technical authorisations. So just to be clear, it's going to be the more significant, the novel, the unusual, the high profile, the complex um, cases that are going to be uh, discussed more likely through the board. And on the other matters, we're going to be going through our normal assurance process uh, to ensure that they've been handled properly. So just to be, to be clear, that won't be the route, route for publication. Um, and the final thing I think is the board would like to see it, it more clear in that risk analysis um, diagram we've talked about this before the sort of the whole end-to-end -end process that sort of starts when something is, is is landed in the system and and finishes when it goes out of our door but it might be valuable for public understanding to include those are the the ministerial element of it at the far end and some of the things that might cause something to land at our door at the front end of it we've talked before about how uh, requests for authorizations may come in from an industry body, a particular business through trade discussions, etc. So I think those are just things that the board have said before, and I don't want us to have to say them all over again. Um, Rebecca. Yeah, just to just to pick up a couple of your points, Heather. Yes, absolutely. Take your comments on the diagram. It, it hasn't been easy to capture this complex process in a in a in a uh, simple graphic. Uh, and I agree, actually, we, we haven't quite got it right yet. And, uh, and we are revising that. Um, we're also looking at having different products and different uh, at a glance graphics for different audiences. As you've pointed out, uh, what a consumer might might want to know about the process, uh, what a business might want to know, and indeed what decision makers, policy makers and ministers might want to know are probably slightly different because they'll all be looking for their their part in the process. So we're, we're, we're developing a set of communication tools that, that will make that clearer for different audiences. So, um, so yeah, points noted. Thank you. So I think the, the question for the board is, are, are we content that what's, what's before us now reflects the input that we've been making over the last uh, several months about that, that line of sight on the process, the triaging, how things will be decided, how they, how they get to us or get visibility in through, through some other route? In which case, it looks like we're agreeing with those, with the triage and the publication um, uh, process with those comments that, that we've just made amending them. 
And in terms of next steps and, and plans for review, obviously there's a lot more operational detail to do. We, we had uh, originally we scheduled in our December board meeting to have our first annual review of the operation of the risk analysis and risk management process that we designed now nearly two years ago, this first, first iteration, um, but it's not in operation. Um, so that will have to be pushed back until this has had a chance to operate for some time, but it still remains a feature on a forward agenda for the FSA board um, in terms of the, the assurance uh, that the system is working in the way that we intend it to work. Rebecca, you again. Can I just, uh, yeah, can just to come back on that. Yes, yeah, so, so, so um, yeah, uh, we have noted that actually, and although you're right, we, we, it won't be the, um, the full annual report that it might have might have been in other circumstances. I think it would be useful, perhaps in the chief exec's report, just to provide a, a, a bit of a readiness review uh, as we enter uh, January. Uh, as, as again, it says in the paper, um, we are um, making sure that we are staffed up. We have the right resources in place and the right skills. And over the autumn, we, we've got quite an extensive programme of engagement so that our partners across government are ready. And also we'll be doing some uh, stress testing of the process. We'll be doing some rehearsals and some um, and some uh, uh, exercises just to make sure we're absolutely ready for this, because we're, we're, we're very aware of our responsibilities. Uh, we know that we're going to do a great job and, uh, and we'll be able just to give the board an update in the chief exec report probably in December, just to let you know where we've got to. That's the kind of confidence we like, I think, around this board. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the continuing work on that. And Phil, nice to see you here in front of the board. Thank you for being here. Um, unless board members, I can't, can't see any hands up. Um, we will, oh, in which case, that's probably because it's time for everyone to get a 10 minute break to go and get a cup of tea or coffee. So we will pause there and reconvene at 10 to 11. Thank you. Here at the Food Standards Agency, we believe that everybody should be able to trust the food that they eat, and we work to keep it that way. The FSA is an independent government department, and we work across England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Being independent is really important. It means that there isn't a minister or a politician in charge of us telling us what to do. We have an independent board. And because we're outside the politics, that makes it easier for us to operate just on the basis of sound, science, and evidence. And that's what we do. The Food Standards Agency's entire purpose is to protect public health, to make sure that food's safe and that it's what it says it is. And we put your health and your interests at the heart of everything that we do. Now, the good news is that we've got globally respected food standards here, and food and drink sold in this country is regarded as some of the safest food and drink in the world. In fact, when you think about it, there's more than a billion food products sold here every week, and it's a tiny handful that aren't safe. Any business selling food has to make sure that that food is safe and that it's what it says it is. And we and local authorities check that in over 600,000 food businesses. That's from abattoirs to corner shops or from Michelin starred restaurants through to your local takeaway. We also help you make good choices about where to eat using our food hygiene rating scheme. And we've got a national food crime unit that works with police forces and local authorities and with businesses to keep us all safe from the threats of food crime and food fraud. It's really important that we work well with industry. We set the regulations that businesses are obliged to follow and we inspect those regulations directly ourselves or local authorities will do that in, for example, catering or restaurant establishments. We don't only want safe and honest food. We want the public to trust that it's safe and it's what it says it is. We want them to trust our regime for delivering that safety and that honesty. And that's why we work at the FSA in a very open and transparent way. All of our board businesses is conducted in the open. You can come along and watch it in person. You can watch them online. You can even catch up with them on YouTube later. And that openness and transparency carries through into all our research, our data, our consultation documents, our policies, all being available on our website for you to access very easily and understand what we do and why we've reached the decisions that we've reached. So that, in a nutshell, is the Food Standards Agency. And you can find out more on our website, food.gov.uk.
Campylobacter may not be something you have heard of before, but did you know that it's the most common cause of food poisoning in the UK? Approximately 4 in 5 cases of Campylobacter come from contaminated poultry, especially chicken. Bacteria can also be found in red meat, unpasteurised milk and in the environment, like in soil, streams and lakes. You can't see Campylobacter, smell it or even taste it on food, but if it affects you, you won't forget it. Campylobacter spreads easily. Coming into contact with only a few bacteria can cause illness. Symptoms include abdominal pain, severe diarrhoea and sometimes vomiting. Most people who get ill from Campylobacter recover fully. However, it can cause serious health problems in those at risk, such as young children, elderly people and those who are already ill. It can cause serious, long-term conditions and at its worst, it can kill. Cross-contamination is one of the main ways that Campylobacter is spread. Some people wash raw chicken to get rid of bacteria, but that can spread them by splashing onto work surfaces, clothing and cooking equipment. The solution is to handle your chicken carefully and cook it thoroughly. Cooking will kill any bacteria present, including Campylobacter. You can also reduce the risk of Campylobacter poisoning in other ways. Always cover raw chicken, then store at the bottom of the fridge so juices cannot drip onto other foods. Cook chicken thoroughly until flesh is steaming hot throughout and any juices run clear. Wash and clean all cooking equipment and surfaces that have come into contact with raw chicken. And wash hands with soap and warm water after handling raw chicken, its packaging and the bin. And there you have it, FSA explains Campylobacter. You can find out more at food.gov.uk. Food crime may not be something you think much about, but dealing with it is essential. Let's take a look at why. Food is very important because we all need to eat to live. Did you know that the average family in the UK spends almost £60 on food and drink a week? That's around £3,000 a year, and it contributes to the UK's £200 billion food and drink industry. Although we produce food in the UK, more than half of what we eat comes from other countries. The next time you sit down to a meal, have a look at the food on your plate. Chances are a lot of it has travelled many miles and through different countries before it came to a supermarket near you. We call the journey that your food takes a food supply chain. The good news is that the majority of food sold and eaten in the UK is both genuine and safe to eat because everybody deserves to have food they can trust. But there is a lot of money to be made in the food industry, which is why food crime can and does take place. Food crime can affect businesses selling food and consumers, like you, who buy the food. Some examples of food crime include using a cheaper ingredient in place of a more expensive one. For example, substituting beef for lamb. Adding something to a product to reduce costs, such as adding cheaper peanut powder into more expensive almond powder making false claims about a product, like saying something is organic or made in Britain when it is not. At the FSA, we have a national food crime unit that was set up to protect consumers and businesses. The unit gathers information about food crime and shares it with partners who can take action. If you have any concerns or suspicions about possible food crime taking place, contact us on 0207 276 8787. So there you have it. FSA explains food crime. For more information, visit food.gov.uk. Have you ever suffered a reaction to something you've eaten? If you have, you probably have a condition called food hypersensitivity. Let's look into why this happens. There are different types of food hypersensitivity food allergy, Celiac disease and food intolerance are three examples. Food allergy is when your immune system, which helps your body fight infections, mistakes the proteins in food as a threat. Allergic reactions can range from mild to very serious, such as itchiness, hives, vomiting, swelling of the eyes, lips and airways, which makes it difficult to breathe. The most severe allergic reaction is called anaphylaxis, which can even lead to death. You can be allergic to any food, but certain foods are responsible for most food allergies. In the UK, food businesses must tell you if they use any of the 14 key allergens in the food and drink they produce. The 14 include common allergens like nuts, peanuts, eggs and milk, as well as unusual ones such as lupin, celery, mustard and sulphites.
Celiac disease is an autoimmune condition caused by a reaction to gluten found in grains such as wheat. The immune system attacks the small intestines and reduces its ability to absorb nutrients from food. Following a gluten-free diet can prevent long-term health problems. Food intolerance doesn't involve your immune system and is never life-threatening. The symptoms of a food intolerance can occur hours after eating the offending food. People with food intolerance tend to experience symptoms like diarrhea, skin rashes or itching. So there you have it, the FSA explains food hypersensitivity. You can find out more information at food.gov.uk. Here at the Food Standards Agency, we believe that everybody should be able to trust the food that they eat, and we work to keep it that way. The FSA is an independent government department, and we work across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Being independent is really important. It means that there isn't a minister or a politician in charge of us telling us what to do. We have an independent board. And because we're outside the politics, that makes it easier for us to operate just on the basis of sound, science and evidence. And that's what we do. The Food Standards Agency's entire purpose is to protect public health, to make sure that food's safe and that it's what it says it is. And we put your health and your interests at the heart of everything that we do. Now the good news is that we've got globally respected food standards here and food and drink sold in this country is regarded as some of the safest food and drink in the world. In fact, when you think about it, there's more than a billion food products sold here every week and it's a tiny handful that aren't safe. Any business selling food has to make sure that that food is safe and that it's what it says it is. And we and local authorities check that in over 600,000 food businesses. That's from abattoirs to corner shops or from Michelin starred restaurants through to your local takeaway. We also help you make good choices about where to eat using our food hygiene rating scheme. And we've got a national food crime unit that works with police forces and local authorities and with businesses to keep us all safe from the threats of food crime and food fraud. It's really important that we work well with industry. We set the regulations that businesses are obliged to follow and we inspect those regulations directly ourselves or local authorities will do that in, for example, catering or restaurant establishments. We don't only want safe and honest food. We want the public to trust that it's safe and it's what it says it is. We want them to trust our regime for delivering that safety and that honesty. And that's why we work at the FSA in a very open and transparent way. All of our board businesses is conducted in the open. You can come along and watch it in person. You can watch them online. You can even catch up with them on YouTube later. And that openness and transparency carries through into all our research, our data, our consultation documents, our policies, all being available on our website for you to access very easily and understand what we do and why we've reached the decisions that we've reached. So that, in a nutshell, is the Food Standards Agency, and you can find out more on our website, food.gov.uk. Welcome back. Uh, this is a meeting of the Food Standards Agency Board in September 2020, and the next item on our agenda is an update on the Science Council's Working Group on Food Hypersensitivity, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Turner to this meeting, who has been leading this working group and is a very valued member of our Science Council. Julie, I think, is going to uh, introduce the report. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, and yes, very, very briefly, um, Paul Turner has um, come along today to talk through his interim findings um, from working group five. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Paul um, and ask him to give us an overview of those findings and also then to ask uh, Rick Mumford to provide um, the response from the FSA to the recommendations um, from Paul's work. Uh, just before I do so, um, one final reminder for the board um, that the um, insights that this work is providing is being fed into the food hypersensitivity program um, that we have running in the FSA at, at the moment. So it has a very clear uh, direction of travel and pro program to pick up this work and um, take it forward. So uh, if I can hand over to 
Paul, thank you. Thanks, Julie, and, and thanks everyone for your welcome. It's a pleasure being here and representing the Science Council and this particular um, work programme we've been doing. Um, I've got a very brief presentation. Um, I know many people have seen a Food for Thought seminar that I gave quite recently on the, uh, through the FSA, and I believe that's available on the YouTube channel for the FSA for those who are not, haven't seen it as yet. Um, but I think it's important to sort of set the context. Can I have the next slide, please? And so some of you may have seen this, it was widely reported in the media, a press release from the Natasha Energy Research Foundation um, in the middle of June, where there was a comment that very little research is done into allergies in the UK and allergy research is woefully underfunded. And, and personally, I was disappointed by that um, because I'm not sure that's actually the case. Certainly, I'm not going to turn away any further funding, but actually we're not doing too bad. Next slide, please. And so a House of Lords Science and Technology Committee report um, from about 15 years ago now, um, at that time, summarised the sort of the research landscape in the UK. And so we had around three million spent per annum on the UK research councils on food allergy, one to two million pounds per year from the EU funding. And the FSA through its Food Allergy Intolerance Research Programme itself has funded around 1 million per annum over the last 20 or so years. And to me, as, as a research active scientist, that's, hard, that, that, that's, that's a reasonable amount of funding, although I'd certainly be happy to have more. Next slide, please. And the House of Lords report commented that in particular that the factors that needed further research were environmental factors such as early allergen exposure and also the concept how allergy research can impact on healthcare and there's a very significant area of unmet need and the two need to interrelate to each other. Next slide please. And so the FAIR programme was established by MAF in 1994, and obviously MAF then transitioned to the FSA. And as I said, to date, um, over £20 million has been identified and used for research funding and over 50 research projects commissioned. Next slide, please. Um, that has been written up 10 years ago, um, a very nice summary of the achievements of the programme at that stage. And certainly one of the things that we've highlighted in our report is it'd be nice to do a further 10 next, the, the next sort of 10 years of the programme and get that published in the peer review literature. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, but just to very briefly sort of, you know, highlight some of the great outputs from this programme. Um, the investment in the FAIR programme has identified that actually the increase in the prevalence of peanut allergy, for example, um, what is often perceived uh, in the mainstream media as an epidemic, um, actually we're still talking about around two to three percent and that's been stable for the last 20 years or so. So we've sort of hit a plateau now. Um, we've also been able to look at the change of the infant vaccine programme on food allergy prevalence because there is some interesting data in that respect and the FSA is now funding the use of um, exploring NHS data to actually monitor trends in food hypersensitivity and also anaphylaxis and that includes the creation of an anaphylaxis register for the public. There's been a significant investment in work to better understand um, primary prevention that is reducing the risk of food allergy in kids in the first place and that directly addresses as you saw one of the points highlighted by the House of Lords Select Committee. Um, and in particular, how introduction of foods into the infant diet um, can actually help prevent the development of food allergy. And then finally, there's been a significant amount of work in terms of the use of may contain labeling, which we know bothers the food allergic and the, high food, and the consumer with high food hypersensitivity, and actually how that correlates with the actual presence of allergens in foods. Can I have the next slide, please? So all those outputs are very significant. And I think it's important to have that up front. The FSA really has not been sleeping or, or resting on its laurels over the last 20 years in terms of commissioning research. As part of working group five, the Science Council was asked to commission a review into the food hypersensitivity research environment and landscape on behalf of the board. Next slide, please. And so these were our four objectives, um, as you can see in there on the paper that has been submitted to the board for review. And essentially, we are looking at a past, present and future. We've been looking at what the FSA has done in the past and how it's done it, what it's doing at the moment, 
and then what it should be doing over the next five years and also a longer term 10 to 15 year horizon scan. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry. And so um, the first part of this project has been a review into the, the research programme, and that's what I'm presenting today. But there are four other components as well you should be aware of. Next slide. So the first is a review into FSA working practices, and that's certainly feed, fed into the Working Group 5 interim report that you have now. Next slide. And next slide. So this is why it's easier to control it myself. And you now have this interim report um, submitted for consideration. Next slide. Um, there is a priority setting exercise. So the purpose of this was to ask stakeholders, and that includes consumers, what are the gaps in providing safe food for consumers with food hypersensitivity? And so the FSA has conducted a public survey which was done in February, March time. We're now analyzing all that data. We've had a um, a number of workshops already with stakeholders, including representatives of the patient um, groups, as well as uh, patients and their parents themselves, along with industry representatives, to work out together a prioritisation using something known as a James Lint uh, methodology. Some of you may be aware of that because it's used by the NIHR to determine health research priorities. Next slide, please. And so, through that process, we're going to identify 10 top priority areas for the FSA. We'll be able to see how that compares to the current FSA work. And then the next slide, link into Horizon Scan on terms of what the FSA should be doing over the next 10 to 15 years. And then next slide, please, you'll finally get a report in June 21, um, and I'll be delighted to come back and pre to present to you all. So that hopefully gives you a fairly sort of um, brief overline of the work package. Next slide. And so just to sort of present, move on rapidly to the interim report that you have in front of you now. Next slide, please. The, essentially, what we did was assess five areas, strategy and direction of the FSA in its research, how that research program has been managed and what governance has been in place, what the outputs have been and how they've been publicized, what the uptake and the impact has been of those outputs, and then whether the FSA has been able to review those outputs and also learn from how it's undertaken the research in terms of future strategy development. And so for each area in the main report, we've outlined our main observations, the recommendations, and where that's indicated how to take those recommendations forward. As you know, the Science Council tries not to involve itself in operational matters because that's more within FSA remit. It's not for us to tell the FSA what, how to do things. It's to flag up suggestions for future consideration. Next slide, please. And so the main recommendations I'll present over the next few slides. Um, our overall conclusion was that the FAIR programme to date has been very well managed and has been very influential with significant policy implications, not just within the UK, but at international level as well. And it was very obvious to us that these are linked really to the dedication of the existing FSA staff and contractors, many of which have gone beyond the call of duty to make sure that this programme has developed, has delivered appropriately. Next slide. So in terms of strategy and direction, we noted that there'd been a decrease in investment in the FAIR programme since 2010. And that's partly be obviously because of the overall economic environment in the UK and in particular within government. Um, we did know that with the introduction of area of research interests across governments, it would be helpful for the board to provide a steer as to what the role the FSA should play in commissioning broader research. This has been flagged up because the FSA obviously is there with charged with providing safe food for consumers. But a lot of food allergy also involves the provision of healthcare and also in, is involved in preventing allergy from existing in the first place. And there is a bit of a grey zone between what areas are directly providing safe food for consumers versus what areas should perhaps be taken on by other parts of government or other research funders. But because that hasn't necessarily happened in the past, often the FSA has sort of taken up some of that grey zone area. We thought that was probably appropriate. For instance, if the FSA can um, 
obtain data on public health interventions to reduce the burden of, effort, of food allergy and food hypersensitivity and to reduce the number of people it has to protect from those conditions that would probably be within the FSA remit and that's been highlighted by the board before but a lot of the members of the public and consumers thought that there was more research needed in areas of healthcare delivery which would be outside FSA remit so that's certainly something for the FSA board to consider. Sorry, can I go back to the previous slide? And then, so the second uh, point that we want to highlight is also the means by which science and data are brought to the Food Hypersensitivity Programme Board in order to avoid the trap that we often all fall into in organisations, both commercial and governmental and non-commercial, of working in silos. It's really important that everyone knows what work is happening in order to maximise efficiencies. Next slide. So in terms of Commission of Research tenders, um, one highlight was um, as a result of economic limitations, there used to be regular stakeholder meetings, not just of in academia and researchers, but with industry and patients as well, and external reviews to try and set the research agenda. And that ceased after 2010 with one or two one-off events as the exception. And our strong advice to the FSA would be to consider reinstating that because it provided a real significant means of engagement and it, to ensure that things didn't happen in silos and not happen in isolation. We also commented um, that there's been an adverse impact of GDPR regulations on research. That's something that's been flagged up by UKRI as well. And it would important, be important um, to um, take those concerns to the Information Commissioner's Office to really try and drum up some pan-governmental guidance for researchers and for organisations like the FSA commissioning research to try and minimise the risks of GDPR in terms of appropriate research with that while at the same time maintaining data protection. Next slide. In terms of management and governance, um, there was a critical reliance, as is the case in many organisations, on linchpin individuals and a real risk that if those individuals move on, there'll be a loss of institutional knowledge and thought needs to be given as to adequate resourcing and strategies to capture best practice and protect that institutional knowledge. And whether there is, could be better use of expert project managers who could perhaps be better qualified than FSA scientists to undertake that element of research commissioning and research management. And again, as I've already highlighted, the need to reinstate regular stakeholder meetings and external reviews. Next slide, please. We thought there should be additional resources allocated to maximise the use of routinely collected data across the FSA. So some people have the perception that the only research the FSA conducts in food hypersensitivity is within the FAIR programme. But actually there's lots of other activity, research activity such um, through sort of ACSS and the social science and the food and news surveys, as well as incidence data as well. And we felt that there was a gap there, that there wasn't ex sufficient internal resource at the moment to really optimise use of that existing data that's being collected routinely to inform where there's potential risks and potential need for interventions. Next slide, please. And in terms of maximising impact, um, we thought that the FSA should document a clear process for data sharing um, so that the very significant data that is generated through FSA funded work is available for other researchers to really sort of try and optimise and maximise the, the value for money that's obtained. Next slide please. In terms of review and learning, again, we thought it was important to reinstitute a mechanism for external review to a degree. We're doing that on the Science Council at the moment because we are semi-external, but nonetheless, we are a specialist committee of the FSA. And we thought it's important to re-engage with external stakeholders to um, help develop the strategy um, for moving to the future. And so finally, to wrap up, we request that the FSA develops a strategy setting out how it would address these recommendations. And as importantly, then as we've done with pre our previous reports, feedback to the Science Council in 12 months time so we can ensure that there is ongoing work and progression in this area. Thank you. Paul, thank you for laying that out so very clearly for us. Uh, Rick, you're going to let us know where we are in terms of 
picking up and taking forward these recommendations. Yes, thank you very much, Heather. Um, yeah, and can I start by thanking Paul and the Science Council for their excellent interim report. It's um, it's a really great piece of work. I'd also like to acknowledge the, the support that the FSA team and in particular Alicia Barfield have, have given to, to Paul and Science Council in, in doing this. It's obviously been a particularly challenging time due to COVID-19 with, with things being delayed and, and pushed back and lack of face to face. So I think they've um, they've adapted very well. And I, th I think you've seen from the interim report, the excellent progress that's been made. Um, we're, we're obviously really looking forward to the to receiving the final and full report um, next year, as, as, as Paul's laid out. Um, but I think this this uh, report does give us an excellent opportunity to look at the um, working groups interim findings and recommendations and um and 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 as mentioned for to give us an opportunity to respond um i think the first thing i would really like to say is and and really welcome is the strong recognition of the contribution that the fair program has made over the last two decades um it's laid out in 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 the annex um, the the range of projects have done and the, the the range of work that has been done that's really helped push forward the um our understanding of this uh, insidious uh, disease, um, and I think the um, I, I think it's it's very good to to have that sort of um, laid out in one place, and so we can really understand the significant contribution we've made, and actually that it's not been an insignificant uh, contribution by the FSA over that time. I think the the second point was 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 to have a look at those interim recommendations and Paul's just talked them through and obviously we will we will go away and we will look at these and we will start to develop our our, our implementation plan we broadly recommend the um the the the, the recommendations um, but I think there's also an opportunity just to provide the board with a small update on on where we are with some of those things. Um, rather than it's not that we're doing nothing at the moment. There's quite a lot of things already in train, and I think it would be really good to just to highlight some of those. So the first thing to talk about, and and it is mentioned in the recommendation, were the areas of research interest. Um, we have now published these. All government departments should have. We have a new refresh set. And you will see that food hypersensitivity is one of those four priority areas for us. And I think what's really important about the ARIs is they, they identify our knowledge gaps, they identify the sorts of areas of research that we want to do moving forward, but they also act as a calling card. So it's something that we can go and engage with others, such as UKRI, um, in, in further discussions. And in fact, in other areas, we're already doing that. There are already um, research councils coming to us and saying, oh, what are your ARIs? What do they look like? How can we engage with you? So I think that's a, a really important point and a really good step in progress that we're making. Um, but I think the other point is that the ARIs shouldn't be seen as a standalone thing. They're actually start of, uh, of or you could see it as a starting point for a more developed research and evidence program approach that we are taking. So you could start with the ideas, the ARIs capturing those, which we then developed into concepts, which we then deliver as projects, which we then look at delivering better impact, better insight, better action. And from that, we can then learn as well. And this is the process we're trying to develop across the FSA for all of our research and evidence. So there will be 11 programmes of which food hypersensitivity is one, and it's definitely in, in progress. I think this addresses some of Paul's uh, and the working group's recommendations around the interdisciplinary nature of, of science. So yes, we do have the FAIR programme and the sort of, if you like, the biology side of things and the immunology side of things. Um, Paul alluded to the work we're doing in social science, consumer insight. Um, it also, um, we're doing work on the cost of illness, so the economists are building a cost of illness model for um, allergy as well. And it's really critical that we link all these different disciplines together into an interdisciplinary approach, and the research and evidence programmes will do that. But it will also provide a mechanism for us to plug in to, um, if you like, the customers of this knowledge, um, our customers in Rebecca's uh, directorate in policy, in incidents, in operations, et cetera. And they will also be stakeholders within these, 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 these research and evidence programs. And again, that's part of the, the question about governance. This research and evidence program around food hypersensitivity will be directly pluggable into the food hypersensitivity program. So we'll have that direct link between the evidence and knowledge base and how we deliver our food hypersensitivity policy and, and action. 
Um, and we, it will also be a mechanism for, I mean, it's designed into the programs, how we actually deliver impact, look at uh, better dissemination um, and also um, an opportunity to review. And there are examples of where we've, we've taken tiny steps already in other areas such as AMR to start doing that review process. So we're building models for how we could do it. Um, the next point, um, penultimate point I wanted to bring up was one about data and just to say, yes, we see that's really critical great flows of data, access of data. We obviously have a, a, a whole a tradition of openness and transparency about data, but we want to make sure we can access it better. And certainly there's there's work in train around incidents and, and incidents data and how we can access that better as well. So this is again, progress being made in those areas. Um, and my final point was about resources. Yeah, absolutely critical. We recognize that, yep, yeah, due to um, um, previous situations, we, we have seen a reduction in, in, in resources, but we can say that that is, is changing. Um, we've obviously been able to fully resource and support um, the work of Working Group 5. We have now recruited extra science staff in this area. And also that point about um, professional contract managers um, we are in progress of creating a research and evidence team which will do exactly that. It will take some of the, if you like, the admin burden of managing projects and contracts off of the scientists, allow them to focus on the technical side and, and professionalise that whole contract management piece. So that's in progress and that will be true um, of all the research and evidence programmes. Um, and the final final point there was also the, the point about funding. We are in a CSR 20 bidding process at the moment and developing our, our, our bids for, for the next uh, three years. Um, and I can say that we are looking at research and evidence in the area of food hypersensitivity. There will be an allocation going forward, a significant allocation, and hopefully we can at least maintain um, the levels of research that we've historically seen um, going forward. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. I I just know, uh, Paul, um, uh, Rick, Julie, how delighted the board will be to see the progress in this area. I know this is an interim report, but we, we've we signalled so clearly and made a big commitment in this whole area and, and getting these lessons at this stage, which impact not only where we are in hypersensitivity, but have got some really valuable learnings um, and things we can build on in terms of our wider approach the way in which we commission and use science and engage the whole of the department and others in that all really really valuable and i think lots for us to keep an eye on in that as we uh, as we look forward um, and on the resources point rick has just summed that up brilliantly um we can't print our own money unfortunately but the board and the ex exec have done all they can to find the resources to give more attention to making progress in this area. Um, it is an interim report board. So uh, aside from endorsing the direction, um, it's, it's not a, a wider debate about our approach on hypersensitivity. We, we've set a strategy, we're pursuing it. That's going to be a regular feature on these agendas. I'm going to come to Tim first. Thank you. Um, Great report, great interim report, really encouraged by the tone and direction of what's been described. So thank you, Paul, for that. Um, I guess uh, my question is, is to pick up on some of the points you raised, Paul, but also Rick, on how we're responding. Um, I mean, it's absolutely vital that we're able to bring together that health economic and wider economic impact as assessment, I think, looking at levels of burden and human costs for individuals and groups, absolutely vital. Um, credible research data, absolutely uh, vital as well, uh, but also how we're harvesting from health and health um, status and service uh, data sets. And so are we looking, and perhaps you could say a little bit more, Rick, about how we're looking at collaborating, cooperating in terms of protocols with those data sets um, at, a, at, a, at a high level, um, to ensure that the point about GDPR and opportunities for sort of joint harvesting that and hopefully more, more economically using the resources we've got available uh, can be put into practice. Rick, do you want me to answer initially? Yes, you start, Paul, and I'll follow up. Okay, so, so one conflict of interest that is on the FSA website for me is that I am currently receiving money to extensively investigate NHS data in terms of the use of NHS facilities for people with food hypersensitivity. And that's not just at risk of anaphylaxis, but celiac disease intolerances as well. 
And ironically, because that data is fully anonymized, um, GDPR is much less of an issue. Where it becomes an issue is more on in terms of um, data that isn't already de-identified that resides within the Department of Health uh, or NHS databases. And this has been a massive thorn in all of our sides um, in academia as well as in the, the commercial area. Um, because I'm sure when the GDPR legislation was originally written, um, it was not intended to impede research such as this, but unfortunately it is. And the ICO have been very reluctant to date to provide any guidance on research, the research community in the UK on the interpretation of GDPR and how to minimise those risks. And it is a major cause of delay in getting projects up and running. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a coordinated um, approach across government to the ICO to fix this problem and produce some guidance. Obviously, there are lots of other priorities happening at the moment within the FSA and within government, um, but it's certainly something that needs doing. And um, I would certainly encourage the FSA and UKRI and other organisations to make a collective approach to ICO, perhaps with um, the support of certain key politicians and members of the House of Lords who are working in this area to really try and get some guidance because it really is a bit of a handicap at the moment. Thank you very much for that. Now, board members, um, I've now got five of you wanting to contribute. I do just want to remind you with about 20 minutes over time now. And this is an interim update report. So I'm just keen that we kind of focus on that. Uh, Margaret and then Robin. Okay, thank you. I'm going to talk very fast. Um, <coughs> I really loved this report. I love the way that it's got the um, brought together the past, but also it's pushing ideas for the future. Um, FSA staff have clearly been doing a brilliant job, and that's fantastic. But sadly, uh, we cannot avoid the fact that um, people are still dying because the food they're eating is not safe because they have hypersensitivities. And um, I think we've got to also bear in mind that there are going to be new risks in this field with COVID, with uh, possible recession, with possible food changes in food sources. Um, so um, uh, we cannot um, deprioritize in any, in, in any way. Um, on the research, I think that we can't do everything. There was a question posed there. And I think Rick has actually answered that question. It has to be a holistic cross-government uh, response and then there are specific areas we can be responsible for. I would like to mention what um, Professor Turner's just said about the uh, may contain labelling uh, not working really for people with allergies and um, I would love to see work returning to this again um, because it's come up for years and years and years but it's still not quite working and we have an obligation to help consumers make informed decisions um, and I just also like to uh, just ask a little question about would that be possible are there plans for that but also um, just pointing to the um, unrecognized work that might be able to use data for example um, to find solutions as well thank you Thank you, Margaret, for all of that. I've got Robin, Dave, and then Rebecca can come back and uh, tie things up. Robin. Thanks very much, Heather. Uh, so I'll just be very brief. I have three quick points, and my first one was, was uh, tackled by Tim around GDPR. Um, Paul, I think this is an excellent report. I was really impressed. Thanks so much for your hard work on it. Um, and really, the, my comments were just to, uh, I guess, offer any support I can from a CSA perspective, both in terms of that GDPR issue, which, as you say, stretches right across government, and perhaps something we could look at um, uh, addressing via the CSA network. Um, and the second comment on uh, stakeholder engagement, which I would totally echo, is really critical both in terms of stakeholders at the at the level of consumers and people with hypersensitivities, but also in terms of other government and research departments. And I think you touched on it already, this issue of uh, the interface between healthcare, FSA, wider consumer and industry is a tricky one. Um, and really to kind of uh, echo that point about being really important that we get that right. And again, to offer any support that we can to try and navigate that, that tricky gray area between departments. Thanks very much. Dave? Um, uh, briefly, uh, welcome to the report. Thank you very much. I uh, could see the progress being made. 
Um, I guess I just have one comment um, as a little maybe gate to put in during the implementation. Um, this is, as Margaret has uh, discussed, a high profile issue. Um, and I just want to be sure that when we do get to our final solution and the final report, um, we maybe check a couple of things. One, that we're taking the appropriate level of responsibility. Uh, we've been really good on AMR, for instance, in, in doing that uh, and make sure that other agencies are taking their fair share as well around the research. Uh, and two, um, ensuring that the activity we are undertaking is proportionate, um, bearing in mind there are other foodborne risks as well, which may be less high, pro less high profile, certainly in terms of the media, um, but equally or perhaps more damaging to the public health. Thank you. Dave, thank you very much for that. Um, absolutely on point. Rebecca, would you like to wrap some of that up for us? Yeah, be delighted. So uh, just to add that uh, we really welcome this report as well. And in terms of the strategy and the programme, really welcome the advice about how we can be great customers for the science and uh, get that policy policy push, science pull, or uh, whichever way around you want to put it, uh, working really well because um, you know, what we need to do is make sure that this science and evidence base that we have uh, leads to uh, real understanding and real action that will improve the lives of consumers who have these conditions. Um, just it was a reminder that we're, we're due to bring a, a, a report on progress with the strategy and programme to the board in December. Uh, and we can pick up there some of the questions that um, board members have asked about work in progress, but it does include work on um, may contain precautionary allergy labelling. Um, we're doing two things. We're looking at our own uh, um, approach here in the UK, uh, but we're also working through Codex to look at the international standards on this and we'll, we can update you more in December. And, uh, and, and yes, Dave, also the, the cost of illness work uh, that we're pursuing will, will give us exactly that ability to, um, to, to look at foodborne um, disease and food hypersensitivity in context and get a sense of, uh, of the impact. And, uh, uh, and if anything, I would say that we, we've not given food hypersensitivity um, the priority that it perhaps should have had now that we're understanding more about the impact and the costs both to the economy and to individuals. So I think it will strengthen the case for action. Thank you, Rebecca. Paul, I think you've delivered, if you heard from the board, a really influential and highly valued interim report. So thank you to you and all the members of the working group. It's, it's, it's a really important report for us. Um, and I think it will have a long standing and long lasting impact uh, for the FSA and for people with uh, hypersensitivity and, and in other areas of our work. And, and this is just the interim. So thank you very much for all the effort that's gone into it so far. For uh, people who are watching our um, uh, board meeting today, and um, you might want to look on our website. There's a really super video briefing that, uh, that Paul gave to uh, some of our colleagues in the FSA, and it's been shared with the board as well. A really useful background uh, video, which helps give you a bit more context about this whole area of what we know, where the research has been, uh, the approach there has been so far in trying to make life better for people with a hypersensitivity and it's well worth watching. But this has been a really important milestone. So thank you ever so much, Paul. We really appreciate it. And we will move on now. Our next report is the a report uh, from the National Food Crime Unit. Colin uh, Sullivan and Darren Davies are going to present to us. And it's just an update for the board in advance in December of us having a fuller review, uh, annual review on the NSCU. But this is an update on the pending publication of the Food Crime Strategic Assessment. Colin, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Heather. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, as you say, this is uh, a summary of our uh, Food Crime uh, Strategic Assessment, um, which has been developed uh, by NFCU and also in concert with colleagues uh, from Food Standards Scotland. And interestingly, uh, they are discussing it at their board tomorrow. Um, and I should say that uh, this is the second uh, food crime strategic assessment that we've undertaken. We undertook one in 2016, also with colleagues from uh, Food Standards Scotland. Um, and that was essentially a baseline uh, position um, at the beginning of the, uh, at the establishment of NFCU. Um, we didn't undertake one in 2018 as we were building the unit uh, and responding to the additional funding uh, available from Treasury. Uh, 
Um, but in many ways, uh, the, the same themes are emerging in 2020 as they did in uh, 2016. Um, the work was completed just before lockdown with COVID, uh, but we've, sh we've shown our uh, assessment through the COVID lens. We've also taken account of the fact that um, uh, we need to be alive to what might happen uh, in terms of um, crime, uh, uh, food crime uh, opportunities uh, following EU transition. And, and how that changes the landscape. And also, of course, we're conscious that um, we're in the face of a recession. So those are the factors that we were bearing in mind, but I'll, I'll turn to Darren to, to go through some of the detail for you. Many thanks, Colin. Um, thank you, Chair and board members. Colin has obviously set up the, um, the context a little bit for the assessment. So well, this is the second outward facing strategic assessment. It, it does lead on to an annual sort of review of our priorities. So th those have been refreshed um, frequently since the inception of the unit and through its um, expansion now. So Colin's alluded to the baseline and the work with Food Standards Scotland. So the paper this year summarizes the, the, the finding and conclusions of the 2020 assessment and which leads us on to some priority areas. Uh, which when published will look to provide all stakeholders really, consumers, businesses and others with an indication of what our planned actions are to mitigate aspects of risk. Um, there's a couple of key points I think which are laid out in the paper. The first is that our work is in regard to serious fraud and criminality within food supply chains. So um, this, this isn't focusing on uh, low level issues, it's for serious fraud. Um, but also is um, recognizing that many, many, and the vast majority of food businesses and those involved in the food supply chains are legitimate and operating completely in, in accordance with rules and certainly going nowhere near criminal aspects of fraud. So, um, you know, the work with industry and stakeholders and consumers is critical for us. And we're always keen to receive new information, which, which uh, this is an iterative process and new information which leads from this will always be assessed. It draws intelligence from a variety of sources, as I've alluded to, our own databases, which continue to expand over time. Local authority returns, open source data and partner agencies and, and increasingly, of course, as well as across the, the colleagues within the FSA, increasingly partners outside it, such as the Food Industry Intelligence Network, FIN. So this is the first time our assessment has included many, many thousands of aspects of sampling and data that, that FIN um, gathers through its, through its uh, membership and body. Collins alluded to COVID-19 and as I touched upon in, in the paper, um, an assessment from the National Crime Agency Economic Crime Centre earlier in the year suggested only about 5% of fraud incidents reported to action fraud were linked to COVID-19 in any way. So th there's frequently been hypothesis that COVID-19 and other changes in the, in the food supply chain landscape, clearly EU exit and the impending or the presumed recession, as Collins alluded to already, could create an opportunity and landscape for exploitation by criminality. But the truth is, um, there's been no empirical evidence of that uh, to date. And um, indeed, countries in, in Europe and partners who had the similar hypothesis who are slightly ahead of us in, in the COVID life cycle, for example, similarly haven't seen that translating into actual effect on, on uh, the levels of reported crime. So we continue to be vigilant to any threats arising, of course. Um, but that's an ongoing issue. And at present, criminal exploitation of these threats has been minimal, really. It cannot, as the paper alludes to, it can't be discounted in the longer term, of course. And um, changes of behaviors of consumers and business as a consequence are um, issues where we are alive to, and continuing vigilance is clearly necessary. So, on to the assessment itself. Um, it contains the context of the current environment, which I've touched upon noting some difficulties that have been highlighted by the National Audit Office report around funding of local authorities and um, the wider um, 
shortcomings is perhaps too strong a term, which is alluded to in the paper, but there was a, a wider review of fraud published in January this year um, within the sort of broader law enforcement landscape. And it's quite well reported that um, quite often fraud isn't necessarily to the fore and in the priorities of uh, law enforcement partners and specifically, of, of course, not within the food space. And therefore, um, we, we are operating in that context. The intersections between serious organised crime and food crime um, are limited. We are seeing some overlaps, but by and large, that isn't uh, of hugely um, hugely prevalent for us. Not, not necessarily the same in other countries. And the threat assessment structures itself around the seven main techniques of food crime. These have been well reported previously, including as you know as far back as. The Elliott report um, back in 2013 uh, on, the, on, the, on the back of the, the horsemeat incident. And the final section of the paper seeks to have a predictive view of the future and what we might be prepared to um, posture ourselves to deal with going forward, really. As Colin said, many strong theme, themes of consistency. Um, so the threats have not evolved significantly or altered significantly, and the techniques are, are the same in any event. The key aspects in the assessment remain those broad techniques, uh, theft, mainly around livestock theft and offences involving European distribution fraud is the technical term, where by and large food businesses and the food supply chain um, providers are victims, in essence, of fraud themselves. So this isn't just about us seeking to police uh, nefarious practices within a small minority of people involved in the food supply chain. It's also about tackling criminality where food businesses and manufacturers are victims themselves. And we've got a number of cases ongoing involving that type of activity. Um, unlawful processing, illegal slaughter, and unlawful harvesting in particular of shellfish continues to be an issue that we, we will seek to focus on. And clearly a theft of livestock, as is alluded to in the report, and illegal slaughter often go hand in glove also. Waste diversion and the, the presence of materials. Excuse me, sorry oh, to interrupt you, Darren, but course, we won't have any time for board members. So I think if we can sort of pause there, there's a lot in the report and the board members will have read it. And I'll, really? I'll, I'll go back to board members to raise any questions or points, which might be the things that you were about to say anyway. So you'll be really cross with me then when that happens. Not at all. Thanks, Chair. No, not at all. Thank you very much. So just to remind the board, we will have a fuller review of progress on the NFCU um, later in the year. But this is anything that the board wishes to raise, be aware of, or, or take into a flag in any way um, on the food crime strategic assessment in advance of us uh, moving to publish the full assessment uh, later this month. And Colm, and then Mark. Sure, thank you, Darren. Thank, <clears throat> thank you for the report. Uh, it's a useful update at this point. Uh, <clears throat> really very little to raise that maybe we await the food report. Delighted to see that you're you're. <clears throat> going to publish the operational control strategy for NFCU at the same time. I think that is quite important. Uh, and we do talk about working across Whitehall and the devolved administrations. Obviously, from a Northern Ireland context, we are quite concerned, as, as you're aware, the PS and I are quite concerned with the risk of increased organised crime in the food space post-EU exit. Uh, do we have the links and contacts with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland just to, to, to close that piece off? Yes, Colm, as you allude to, we're working closely with PSNI colleagues about preparedness, and not just in line with the EU exit, but in the natural consequence of us developing and evolving as a unit. And we link closely with uh, FSAI in, in the Republic, and indeed information from them has been part and parcel of compiling the assessments and data within this report. Yes, so yeah, we are linked closely with colleagues. Mark. Thanks, Heather, and thanks, Darren, for, for the report. Interesting stuff. I was just a little bit uh, concerned that in the in the task activity you mentioned in relation to the control strategy, there's nothing about investigation and enforcement. Uh, and I would have liked to have seen something along that. Uh, I know that there are some issues around powers and so on, but nevertheless, it is a key factor. I'm just wondering if there's a reason that's not in there specifically. Uh, thanks, Mark. No, clearly, investigation and enforcement is. Um a key element of the 
the P the four P plan, as is alluded to in under pursue, we've got in excess of forty ongoing investigations, both in terms of um, traditional sort of criminal justice outcomes being sought, but also in terms of developing intelligence and information to to verify the degree of activity that's ongoing. So maybe that's not alluded to specifically within this paper, but yeah, that's a key element of what we're doing. We've got many cases ongoing and um, some some fairly complex and large scale fraud activity that we're in liaison with the Crown Prosecution Service over now uh, with a view to seeking charges to take through the criminal justice process. Yeah, so that's a key cornerstone of what we're doing. But importantly, um, it's the prevention activity as well that's underway. That, you know, ideally, we want to get to the point where everything is prevented. Now, clearly, there's no panacea or silver bullet in that. But yeah, enforcement is, is a key, key cornerstone of what we're doing and um, a key driver for the expansion of the unit, in the truth. And I think we'll, we'll get more detail on that in our report in December, Mark, in terms of that sort of volume of activity. Uh, to the extent it can be shared uh, in public with the board, this may also be one of those rare occasions where there's some content that we can't put into the public domain immediately. So uh, we'll we'll handle that closer to the time in terms of giving the board the fullest fullest understanding of the uh, progress of the NFCU. Anything else that we want to bring in at this stage? Because if not, I think that's very helpful thank you very much Darren for bringing that to us as a um, an, an update and an, an advance uh, warning of the publication we'll look forward to the impact the full report has when it's published and see you back in December any thanks thanks very much sir. thank you um, and we'll now move on to Colm's report as chair of ARAC Sure, thank you. I, I don't intend to go into this in detail. We met just last week. Uh, uh, we were quite tight, as you know. We, we uh, as of last week, we were barely quarried with just the three members. Delighted that uh, that Peter has now joined and will be on our next ARAC in November. The, the, the paper's there. We cover the areas around risk management. I'll have a good look as we do on a quarterly basis at the risks and, and uh, just to make, make ourselves absolutely satisfied that they're correctly. Uh, rated, uh, if you like, particularly as we move into things like EU exit. Uh, we had a briefing from Jenny Desire on the uh, information security update. Uh, I'd come back in a, in a moment just about the financial accounts. Uh, we looked at the ARC self-assessment and, and agreed what needs to be done. One of the things that had been discussed was bringing some directors along on a regular basis to ARAC, but these are much broader than just ARAC, and I think that uh, you've already, Chair, had some discussions uh, on that with, with Emily. Uh, we looked at the internal audit progress report uh, uh, and the and the area of deep dives we'll be getting into later in the year. Going back to the um, financial accounts update, uh, Martin did uh, give us an update on that. Um, uh, fairly, and then following the meeting, wrote to myself and Emily with a very a very detailed update. Uh, there has been further delays. The, the accounts for Northern Ireland and Wales were both laid before the end of June. Uh, and I, I do want to point out again that the FSA uh, team is uh, almost uh, in its own in the public sector across uh, the UK and getting things done in time. Uh, there is this slight issue around the, uh, the London Pension Authority in which we have a small interest, uh, but unfortunately we're not in a position to, uh, to finalise the accounts until uh, Grant Thornton have uh, been able to sign off on the external audit of that. Uh, that was hoped to be done by the end of August. We're now hoping for mid to late September. Uh, but there are contingencies allowed by Treasury, uh, which should sort of keep us clear uh, up until the end of January to get everything laid properly. So there, there is that little bit of uh, uh, leeway there. But we still need to, uh, hopefully we'll get it all done by the end of September. Uh, but I would uh, emphasise again that this is an issue uh, which is a, in which the, the FSA is a very small player in the overall scheme of things, something in the region of 2% of the total fund is relative to us, uh, so it affects many parts of government across. Uh, but the, the team, uh, uh, Martin in particular, has it under control and is doing everything in its power to get it uh, finalised as quickly as possible. Ooh. 
need to press the unmute button there. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Colm. I, I know almost all the board is currently on at ARAG, so there might not be anybody who's got anything else to add to that at the moment. Um, and I, I did mention at our last board meeting, but now that Peter is with us, I will just again uh, record that he also will be joining the Audit and Risk Advisory Committee, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and Colm and I have had some useful conversation over the last uh, two or three weeks about the focus areas for ARAC over the next few months and some of the uh, areas of deep dive that um, Colm and the, uh, the members of the committee are thinking of looking at. So I think that's going to be a really good addition to the level of assurance that ARAC is providing to the board in, in uh, some challenging situations. I don't think I can see anybody with their hand up about that. So um, I'll let Colm get a breather and ask Ruth for any additional um, updates she wished to share from the Welsh Street Advisory Committee, which she kindly chaired for us. Uh, I know that Peter was able to join it, but just because it was so hot on the heels of his appointment. So thank you, Ruth, for doing that. Uh, no, it's a pleasure to um, uh, chair the meeting. And as you say, Peter observed the proceedings as part of that induction process. Um, uh, I think most of the comments that the committee made have been incorporated into observations that have been made at the board today. Um, I think going forward, uh, the uh, Safe, Sustainable, Authentic Food Wales group um, meets next week again, and it's proving to be a very useful source of general intelligence about uh, food system issues in Wales, and particularly the impact of COVID, for example, at its last meeting. Uh, so I know that we uh, were looking to continue to cement that relationship and make sure that the Welsh Food Advisory Committee had regular uh, input of information from, from that uh, discussion. Um, and then the next meeting that um, Peter will be taking forward uh, will be the um, review of the sort of policy landscape in Wales. Uh, and that's been arranged for October. That's it. Thank you. And Colm, no fact. Uh, Chair, thank you. Uh, again, uh, similar to Ruth, the, the NIFAC views were incorporated in any comments I made on the way through this morning to be met last week to discuss the board meeting. Uh, our next meeting is in, uh, our next open meeting of NIFAC is planned for the third week in October. Uh, and we're hoping to have along with our uh, Joy Alexander from DERA, who's leading on the Northern Ireland food strategy, uh, and uh, um, Michelle Sherlow, and uh, representative uh, Nick Whelan, the chair of the Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association, really just quite how we get it as open as we'd like it to be. We're not sure in the virtual world, but we'd make it as open as it's possible to be. We won't invite members of the public, obviously, but we'd find a way to make it as open as possible. And then the only other issue to raise with board to remind board members and yourself, Chair, is we're moving into recruitment for NIFAC members. So we'd be looking for probably at least four, possibly five uh, members uh, and the letters to go from yourself to Minister will be with you by the middle of next week. Thank you. And anything from board members on the uh, progress on NIFAC or WFAC? No. In which case, uh, we have no other business, save for me to say that the next FSA board meeting will take place on Wednesday the 18th of November from 9.30 by Zoom. Hooray, I hear you all cheer for that. Um, but we do have next week a business committee meeting, uh, 23rd of September from 10.30 in the morning. That again is by Zoom. Uh, the, anyone who wishes to watch those proceedings will find the details as usual on the FSA website. And that will close this meeting. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. See you soon. Thank you.